Hi everyone! Today we're looking at one of the more infamous maps in Conquest. Chapter 20, Winds of Change, sometimes affectionately known as Fuga's Wild Ride. An awful lot of people want to get off Fuga's Wild Ride. Since the map objective is Seas, it's possible to send a couple of people up to Fuga very quickly and end the map in just a few turns, and you can even hit the chest with the rescue staff at the same time. But I'm not going to do that. I want to get all the treasure, so I'm going to play this thing straight up. At heart, Conquest 20 is an elaboration on Conquest 10. In Chapter 10, your squad starts out in a safe zone far from the enemies, surrounded by a few narrow choke points. Most of the enemies are on foot, but there are some flyers who get to ignore the terrain and go right past your defenses. And then once your team settles into position, there's a Dragon Vein mechanic that dramatically reshapes the map, opening up new avenues for the enemy. Almost everyone playing Chapter 10 of Conquest for the first time has to scramble to defend the seize points for the last few turns. A lot of them will come up with some clever maneuver to save their position, and doing that creates awesome memories that really stick with people. But the thing about Conquest 10 is that it's all a big lie. Those fancy defensive emplacements, the ballisti, the fire orb, even the breakable walls, are all designed to trick you into defending the starting area so that you get caught in the trap and then you get that crazy white knuckle experience at the end. The easiest and most rewarding way to complete chapter 10 is to ignore all of that, break down your own walls, and engage as many enemies as you can on turn one. You want to beat them back to their spawn points as soon as possible, and you can do that because the individual enemies on that map are pretty weak. Hyperaggression turns out to be the safest option. Your start in chapter 20 is very similar, but here the disruption mechanic starts on turn one and it never lets up and enemy quality relative to your units is much higher now. In Chapter 10, you could get yourself into a desperate situation, but then you can almost always find a resource to rescue yourself. This map disrupts your resources, making that much less possible. But the same truth applies now. When it's especially hard to play defense, you're better off playing offense. If the flow of this map owes a lot to Conquest 10, the structure borrows heavily from 17. The ninja cave is dominated by a central room, the one with a couple of samurai, a pack of ninjas, and the silent shrine maiden. If you can conquer that room quickly, you can turn and smash the ninja reinforcements through the walls. After that, you've established rock-solid map control, and the rest of the battle is a mopping up operation. On this map, the feature that dominates is Hayato and his hexing rod. Hayato himself has good innate stats, and he's wielding the horse spirit, making him hard to kill. On top of that, he's defended not only by a trio of other Omiyoji, but also a squadron of Falcon Knights. And there's even a priestess set up to heal Hayato and cover part of his platform with an enfeeble staff. That's formidable stuff. But then again, let's think about that. His guards are Omiyoji and Falcon Knights. There is one unit type that's basically a hard counter to both of those things, a Master Ninja with the Hunter's Knife. One important mechanic in Faith is that enemies won't use offensive staves if they can deal damage or heal someone instead. If we can engineer a way to send a Master Ninja up to Hayato quickly, and that Master Ninja is strong enough to survive everything around him for at least a turn, he can negate the Hexing Rod and create a lot more breathing room for the rest of the team. Looking at the map, the best tile to approach Hayato on, the pillar southeast of him, are 15 spaces from the closest starting position. To get there on turn 1, you need Azura to refresh a flyer, unless you want to burn a rescue use. And Azura can only sing on the ground, so the closest she can feasibly get is right here, where she can refresh someone above her. Counting it out, that tile above is 9 spaces from the pillars, just barely close enough for a flyer carrying a master ninja. So that's the game plan. First, we'll crush the entire column around Hayato immediately. Landing on his platform will trigger several reinforcements, but that's great because we'll have a healthy team ready to intercept them. Then everyone can sweep left, clearing out that whole side of the map. All of that is doable in just a few turns. Let's take a look at the team I'm deploying. This late in the game, it's impossible for me to pick a set of units that represents what every player will have on hand. To do that as best I can, I'm excluding kids and I'm sticking with bog standard builds, even though you can put together skill combinations that are way more powerful than anything I have here. On top of that, my team is horribly underleveled. Going down the line, I have level 20 and 6 Malignite Corrin, who just changed into Malignite one level ago. There's 20 and 3 Wyvern Lord Baruka, and then my Master Ninja, level 15 and 8 Kaze. You could have much stronger Master Ninjas than Kaze by now, particularly ones who have soul access, like Silas or Soleil. 
but Kaze will do as long as he has a lot of tonics and a little luck. I'm bringing level effectively 16 and 7 Leo, along with 20 and 6 Wyvern Lord Xander. Like Corrin, Xander just switched into the Wyvern line one level ago, and he doesn't have lunge or rally defense yet. Azura is here, of course, and so is 19 and 6 hero Laszlo. He's packing HP plus 5 because he befriended Keaton. Felicia's a level 21 maid, and Camilla is still just level 3. 19 and 7 Merchant Muzu is here mainly for her bow combat, and the same goes for 20 and 1 Bow Knight Niles. 20 and 1 Great Knight Perry is mainly filler, and unpromoted Keaton is here as a bulky dude who can do a tax dance with Mozu. Charlotte, as a level 13 and 5 Berserker, offers rally strength and big para bonuses. As usual, everyone has their average stats. After chapter 19, you can upgrade the mess hall to level 3 so that the meals affect the entire army. I've had Jacob cook up a plus 2 speed, defense, and resistance meal. Kaze needs a lot of help to survive, so I've given him HP, strength, defense, and resistance tonics. I also gave strength and speed tonics to Niles, and a speed tonic to Mozu, so that they could each hit thresholds. Xander got two speed wings and two talismans, plus an HP tonic and a strength tonic as insurance. That's it for the roster, and I've covered the main idea, so let's dive right in. First up is Charlotte. She rallies for anyone who could conceivably use their strength stat this turn. After that, I want to use this Dragon Vein right away, then I can move the rest of my units without disruption. The Falcon Knights will simply get blown south 5 spaces. With the paired Spearmasters, it's a little more complicated. They're right above a void, so the wind will push them across the gap first, then down one more tile, even though that actually adds up to 6 spaces. This Onyoji will get pushed down one space, then across the first gap, but not the second one. The Spearmaster will go three spaces, then cross over to the bridge below. The other Onyoji will also get blown down, but he can't cross the gap because the Spearmaster will already be occupying that tile. Now it's time to send Kaze. Baruka waits to carry him. After that, Kaze walks over and transfers to Baruka, leaving Azura to refresh his ride. Luna is bad news, but Kaze dodges it. Let's take stock here. Hayato can't use the Hexing Rod since he has a valid target in range. But he also doesn't want to attack with his spirits since Kaze will kill on the counterattack. That means he'll prefer to use his Wayne Festal if possible. Likewise, this Priestess's staff range looks intimidating, but Enfeeble only has 7 range. Kaze is 8 spaces away, so the Priestess can't hit him. She's forced to use her Wayne Festal too. Kaze has to withstand an Onmyoji, 4 Falcon Knights, 3 more Onmyoji, including one with the Calamity Gate, and these paired up Spearmasters. The good news for him is that he doubles everything, so barring an untimely crit, Baruka will block every other attack. We can help Kaze out a bit, though. By dropping Laszlo here, we make him a decoy. He's in range of two Falcon Knights, and depending on what happens on enemy phase, he might be able to distract them. You see, the AI in Fates doesn't see ahead. It doesn't understand that it can score kills by dogpiling on one unit. There's a set move order subject to a few modifications depending on the current situation. When a particular unit comes up in the list, 
It evaluates all available targets and then decides what to do by following a simple heuristic. There are some nuances, but the gist of it is this. First of all, if an enemy unit sees an immediate kill, they'll jump ahead in the move order and go for it. Otherwise, if they can't kill anyone, they'll try to attack in such a way that they don't get killed in return. And if that's not possible, they'll just try to maximize damage. In this case, both Kaze and Laszlo can kill with their counterattacks. Kaze with the Hunter's Knife, and Laszlo with Xander's Beast Killer Dual Strikes. So if those two Falcon Knights don't see a kill, and they know that they're going to die regardless, they'll attack whomever they can hurt more. Kaze has 19 defense, and he's standing on a pillar, so he effectively has 20. Laszlo also has 19 defense, but he's out in the open, and he's using a sword against A-rank lances. Because of the weapon triangle, he effectively has 18 defense, two less than Kaze. This means that if Kaze can keep his HP up, then the two Falcon Knights next to him will completely ignore him. One of those Falcon Knights has 34 attack. Since Kaze has 20 effective defense, she should ignore him if he has 15 HP or more when it's her turn to act. But the AI doesn't realize that Guard Stance automatically blocks dual strikes. So if enemies can find an attack stance partner whose dual strike would theoretically kill, they'll think that's a kill shot. Hayato deals 2 damage to Kaze, so 1 damage with his dual strike. That would mean the Falcon Knight would still try for the kill at 15 HP, and Kaze would need 16 to deter an attack. However, Hayato gets 4 of his damage from his personal skill, Pride. It works on dual strikes, but from what I can tell, the targeting algorithm fails to account for it, so it thinks Hayato hits for 0. There's one issue with Laszlo's placement. He's still in range of this Omiyoji, but Perry and Niles can work together to solve that problem. Mozu isn't doing anything essential. I'm just going to have her play with these Spear Masters. One of them has a spear, so she can fight him at 2 range. If Kaze were to dodge these paired Spear Masters, he'd be pretty much home free. No such luck, though. The Omiyoji will go next, and he has pretty good chances to evade those. This Onmyoji has a horse spirit, and that's why Niles needed the speed tonic. Remember, the magic number for Kaze right now is 15 HP. If he keeps at least that much, then the two Falcon Knights next to him will ignore him, and that's really helpful because the Falcon Knights are much harder for him to dodge. Soul Master Ninjas make this much more reliable. They don't have the same res as Kaze, but they tend to have better defense, and as you can see, a ninja with soul has a ton of free chances to recover health. With that dodge, Kaze has ensured his own survival. The turn order will make it so that only one Falcon Knight can hit him. Coincidentally, he gains res, so now Hayato's dual strikes actually hit for zero, even when taking pride into account. Your battle has ended.
It's so nice when a plan comes together. To be clear, this little trick isn't required. It just saves Kaze from having to dodge Naginata at about 60% listed hit. If you want one unit to pair up with another, sometimes you don't have to do it directly. This is one of the big benefits of fighting unpaired when possible. You can do a lot more transfer shenanigans. Look out here. The Omioji on the stairs has counter. You don't want to miss that. The Iron Dagger has no avoid penalty, and it does all the damage I need. I want Leo and Felicia to take on the mages in the southwest corner right now. That's why they're taking these positions, and it's why Leo is using the Horse Spirit. I've left four units in this wind stream. They'll all just get pushed up five spaces. There's room for all of them. Ideally, I want to reach this western platform and clear it next turn. The main obstacle is the priestess and her steel hunkyu. She makes it difficult for Korn and Camilla to do anything there as long as she's alive. But I have one other resource on hand. I can refresh Niles and put him in a position where he can ride the wind. For reasons that'll become clear next turn, I'll want him to attack the Priestess from the north at one range. Camilla could give him a plus 3 damage boost with her personal skill, Rose's Thorns, but I don't want her to have to use her next turn just to get in position. So it's really nice that she can fly here and use the wind herself. It'll put her in exactly the right place. Mozu and Keaton give us an object lesson in the power of coordinating a bow unit and a melee unit in attack stance. Neither of them can kill a Spearmaster by themselves, nor can they do it paired up, but staying in attack stance lets them boost each other for the kill, and Keaton now protects Mozu from attack. Kaze just has to heal himself. I brought a concoction and an elixir to use, as appropriate. These falcon knights all have armored blow, but they still can't withstand the hunter's knife. I have two other things on the agenda for next turn. I need to finally kill Hayato, and I also have to fight off these spearmaster falcon knight pairs. Hey! 
Happily enough, Wyvern Xander can set up close enough to do both jobs. Neat how the guard gauge lined up to block the heaviest hit, right? Guard gauge timing is a major reason why crits and offensive procs are mostly bad in this game. There are lots of stat ceiling skills on this map, but thankfully there aren't any around Kaze. Down here, Leo has to deal with seal strength, which he doesn't care about, and seal speed, which he can work around. Since Hayato has Duelist Blow, the exact amount of HP he has at the end of this turn varies a lot, and because he has Vantage, it matters. Kaze, I appreciate your ability to punch through weapon triangle disadvantage. Believe it or not, that was just turn two. We'll start turn three by dealing with a sideshow in the southeast corner. Clearly, Mozu and Keaton can combine for another kill, but I might be able to engineer it so that they can each get in a dual strike for maximal weapon experience. Optimization, yay! Uh. Next stop, the western platform. Because Camilla is already in place, Niles has enough power to kill. If he had come up short, Camilla would have been able to deal the finishing blow, but not with very good hit rates. For the moment, Camilla doesn't have much to do. I want to keep exploiting Rose's thorns, and I don't want her to blow away, but I also don't need her to attack right now and take damage. Corin kills this Bolt Naginata Great Master by taking Charlotte from Niles. But that leaves Niles vulnerable. Niles and Charlotte had a full guard gauge, and if he hadn't dodged the Priestess, he'd be weak enough now to die to the other Great Master. This is... Felicia's close enough to use Physic on him, though, solving that potential issue. Yeah. Now Perry, Leo, and Azura can team up to eliminate the three Omiyoji to the south. Bye. 
I gave Xander his two tonics to cover two possible eventualities. On the one hand, Hayato could still have a lot of HP, in which case Xander would need the extra strength to kill using Kaze's dual strike. But as we see here, he could also be pretty weak, in which case Xander wants the extra HP so he can absorb a big magical attack. Or you know, he could just dodge. I see. Baruka can easily eliminate this Calamity Gate guy with an axe. If it came to it, she could pass Kaze to Xander and use a Hand Axe plus Xander's dual strike. Let's look at our position. Baruka lunged into the upward stream. Now she's in range of two enemy pairs and Xander will face one. The wind will carry them both to the north along with Laszlo. The group at the western platform has avoided the wind, for now, and they've trapped one enemy Great Master. In the southwest, everyone will get blown down, but that won't affect Leo or Perry much, and it'll actually help Felicia. All four of them need to go east to address the incoming reinforcements. Lastly, the wind gives Mozu and Keaton a nice shortcut to get back in the action. Now it's turn 4. This is the last turn I'm going to present. Remember how I said Leo could work around seal speed? Well, Calamity Gate gives Leo one point of speed. Felicia at C support provides 4 more, and Azura's inspiring song grants another 3. He's still a little shy of doubling these great masters, but he's definitely not getting doubled himself, and he can take them all. Leo has steel magic, and I don't want him to completely neuter the Bolt Naginata guys, so I'm making him attack the ones with steel. This one has a silence rod, but because he can attack Leo, he's not able to use it. Keaton and Mozu get to enjoy another wind aided flight. I have a choice here. I can have them go north so they get blown up to the bridge east of Xander, or I can send them west so they end up at the platform south of Xander. With the former option, they might be able to take on the enemies around the eastern chest. The latter lets me clean up after myself. This western platform is now completely covered by a northward wind stream. If my units stay here, they'll be sent up toward the northwestern corner of the map next turn. Keep that in mind.
As a rule, I want to limit the enemy's mobility, so I'll make Xander kill this Falcon then. She leaves behind a solo Spearmaster who can't reach anyone at the moment. Corrin has a full guard gauge, so he can afford to fight the Spearmaster. I want him to stay in the Windstream, though, so he has to do it on enemy phase. I also know that Mozu will move up next turn, so I want Corrin to fight the Spearmaster in such a way that Mozu can then reach him and finish him off. And of course, I don't want to leave Corrin in a Kenshi Knight's attack range. Lastly, we've got Kaze and Baruka. The wind from last turn pushed them north, so now they can reach the northwestern platform. Kaze takes nothing from the Omiyoji. The Kenshi Knights and the Spearmaster hit pretty hard, but Kaze avoided so much damage two turns ago that he could kill the Kenshi Knight at one range, fill up his guard gauge, and survive both the Spearmaster and the other Kenshi Knight. I'll proceed as though he got badly wounded, though. What's amazing about this is that Camilla, Niles, and Corrin are perfectly positioned to reinforce Kaze next turn. Leo will get blown away, but he has enough movement to get right back where he was, and even if he didn't, Azura could help him return. After four turns, the map is well in hand. In the northwest, we have plenty of troops to overcome the two Omiyoji and the Spearmaster, and then collect the 10,000 gold. Xander can hold Hayato's platform almost indefinitely. Mozu can go kill the one straggler to the west, or she might be able to fight across the gap and have Keaton switch her to a minibow afterwards. In the south, the others can kill off the four great masters without much trouble. Once that's done, we'll have cleared everything in the southwestern two-thirds of the map. And because the wind goes north and south, it's much easier to work left to right than bottom to top. We can always retreat to the left, and we won't get into trouble no matter where the wind takes us. I want to emphasize that you don't have to do everything that I just did. In fact, since my team is pretty weak, you can probably do a lot better. I started with the goal of fighting Hayato. I found a unit who could conceivably survive, and then I took the steps to make that happen. After that, the wind patterns gave me targets of opportunity, and I went for them. That's what I want you to take away. Be aggressive. Hayato's supposed to act as area denial. Don't let him do it. Turn the wind to your advantage. Capture key areas right away so that you can handle the reinforcements proactively. Play offense.
If Kaze were to dodge these paired Spearmasters, he'd be pretty much home free. I have 